Hello, I'm Janice Karen, Director of Policy, Technology, and Innovation at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, or MHTC. I run our Data Governance Collaborative, also known as the DGC. We start each of our weekly meetings with a series of industry quick updates to learn about new and proposed regulations, laws, standards, industry initiatives, and other activity. Join us for this week's updates. We'll go to the first update. Um, so the first news is on Monday, excuse me, a new long-term care bill was signed into law in Massachusetts. And, and it has a lot of provisions around licensure and certification and requirements for services and requirements around how you can, around fees and stuff like that. But there are a few um, data related requirements. And in fact, there are two requirements around prior auth. And so the first one is that there's a one day um, went time limit to respond to prior authorization requests around moving from acute care to long-term care. So that is actually a faster time window than is currently required. And so that's the first change. The second thing that they're doing is um, development of a standardized form for, for those types of prior authorization requests. Now, not to go too far off topic, but you know, that, that that type of form has proven to be a problem around interoperability in the past, especially when there's a set form for Massachusetts and then there are federal interoperability rules that come into play. And so, although in theory, we are for anything that standardizes anything, that development of a form like that specific to Massachusetts does raise some eyebrows. And I don't know, Denny, if you'd like to say anything further on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, we know, for example, um, and we've been working closely with a group called the Massachusetts Collaborative. I, we, we met yesterday afternoon, as a matter of fact. Um, and the Mass Collaborative is, in, includes Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, and the Massachusetts Medical Society, as well as MHDC. And um, I don't think I repeated any of those members, but I might have in my in my dotage. But uh, what what the Mass Collaborative does is they talk, uh, uh, we talk about uh, how can we collaborate to simplify healthcare administration, you know, reduce administrative burden. And a long time ago, we a long time ago being you know five to eight years, um, we came up with a, a require. We came up with a a recommendation that became law in the state that prior authorization forms needed to be standardized across all the health plans. They needed to be no more than two pages in length and they needed to, you know, give a provider just a single form that they could send to any health plan rather than the health plan specific forms that existed before. Uh, we still have that today. And, um, we also have now also forms being proposed, as Janice described, for long-term care. We have forms for drugs. The interoperability challenge is that because of the requirement for forms, payers and providers in the Commonwealth are, are less inclined because of the regulatory requirement around paper forms, uh, see that as a barrier to implementing electronic prior authorization, electronic exchange of this information, um, and moving away from a forms environment, which is still a, I won't say a paper, but it's a, it's a very analog format and it requires humans to be in the middle of what we want to be machine to machine transactions. So humans are relieved, relieved of the burden. So, uh, we have work to do, uh, this will require, you know, as, as the final rule for, for interoperability, which includes post-acute care as well as acute care uh, comes closer to its deadline of January 1st, 2027. This is something we're gonna have to work with the state to, to um, make it clear that the path forward is now, you know, we're moving beyond forms. We're moving to you know, electronic API, EDI transaction, the combination of the two, we're using NCPDP standards for drugs 
and making it a machine to machine exchange. So uh, when we see forms, as Janice said, when we see standardized, we're, we're like thumbs up. When we see forms, we're like, uh oh, we're going to have to work with that, through that, around that. But that the use of a form requires the intervention of a, of a of human on either side of that, which simplifies things in the human world. But when we want to move to electronic automation, digital automation, um, those become barriers that we have to clear. So I I went long there, Janice, but I wanted to provide some context too. No worries. We appreciate it. So I'm not going to call read off everything that's on the sheets. There's a second page to this. Um, but before we go to the second page, does anyone want to comment on anything either that Denny said or that's on this, this sub part of the list? All right, then let's go to the second page. So again, this is um, primarily administrative other than the prior off. Um, and then there are a few task force reports and analyses that are required, as well as some required training around reporting suspicions of abuse. So other, you know, the main thing from our perspective are those prior off um, clauses. But again, if there's anything on here that calls out to you or that you think is worth that you'd like to comment on or ask questions about, feel free. And if not, you can find the full text of the bill at that link. All right, let's carry on then. There are also, excuse me, um, a rule that has not necessarily been on our radar recently was finalized on Monday. And the reason it has not been on our radar recently is that the proposed rule came out over a year ago. And we did briefly talk about the proposed rule when it came out, but um, obviously it's a long time ago. So just a quick refresher, this is a joint rule from HHS, Department of Labor, Department of Treasury um, on mental health parity. And it's basically, um, another indicator that you have to have the equivalent services for mental health versus medical services. And they clarify specific areas where this is true. And one of the th things they call out, um, I think one of the things that wasn't necessarily clear in the proposed rule that they were more clear about in this final rule is they use this term NQTLs all over the place. And that stands for non-quantitative treatment limitations. And it wasn't necessarily clear when they were throwing around that term in the proposed rule that that included things like prior authorizations. The proposed rule was more focused on talking about um, network adequacy than other components. And so they call out explicitly that three, these are still just examples, but three of the things that qualify and that are covered by this our prior authorization requirements, the network composition standards, which was what they focused on in the proposed rule as far as uh, certainly what came out in the proposed rule from my recollection, and also methodologies to determine out of network reimbursements. So this really is intended to cover sort of all of the programmatic structure pieces of mental health coverage versus um, medical coverage and ensure that there's some, what they call, so, you know, they sort of have these, it's not clear to me how they're classifying what's similar, but there needs to be parity between what's similar between the two. So any questions about that before we move on to the second page of this one as well? All right, let's go to the other page then. So, um, in addition to requiring parity on those items, they are requiring data collection and reporting on related things, including um, data on any material differences in access to mental health benefits versus medical ben benefits, particularly if they're caused by one of these NQTLs. And then um, comparative analyses to measure the impact of NQTLs 
And you have to, including specifically measuring the three areas that were called out on the last slide. And then again, you have to design your plan so that you don't systemically disfavor access to mental health benefits compared to medical benefits. And so the there isn't necessarily a ton of detail around exactly what is considered um, adequate or equal in the fact sheet, which is primarily what I focused on to do this review, but you can find a copy of the final rule there as well. And um, if you'd like to find more details about exactly how they intend to determine what constitutes those classifications, presumably, I hope that's in the, the full rule, and um, you know things like like more details about exactly how some of these activities are supposed to be carried out. And if folks would like, um, we can also report back on that further later. So any questions or comments on that? All right, then let's keep going. So <laughs> ASTP has put out another data brief. This one looks at access and use of electronic health information by patients with cancer, and it covers 2020 through 2022. And while they say it's patients with cancer, most of the data is focused on people who have recently gotten a cancer diagnosis. There is some data that it is for anyone with cancer. And there's some cases where they distinguish between people who have had cancer at any point in their life versus those who haven't. But the majority of the stuff they talk about is recent cancer diagnosis versus other. And um, so a few of the highlights that, that came, came away with was that 60% of patients with a recent diagnosis were offered and accept, accessed their online medical records in 2020 through 2022. And that is a significant increase from previous measurement period of 2017 to 2018. And I will say that sometimes when they talk about online medical records, they sometimes just say online medical records and portals, and sometimes they just say online medical records. So I envisioned online medical records being equivalent to portals. So it's not clear if uh, if that is supposed to encompass more. So I do want to also call that out. Um, now, one thing which again is not super surprising is that about twice as many patients with recent cancer diagnoses access their records six or more times in the year per year compared to patients without cancer, and that was like a forty percent to like twenty two or twenty three percent. So it still wasn't, you know, six accesses in a year doesn't seem like a lot for someone who has a recent cancer diagnosis when you're going through all of the tests that lead to that type of diagnosis and the initial treatment things that happen for a lot of patients. So I actually think that's still kind of on the low side, but still, it's still more prevalent for people recently with cancer. And the one thing they called out is that most patients with um, cancer diagnosis use their online medical records to view at least one test result. And which makes sense because a lot of what you're doing in those early stages or in the process of getting the diagnosis is testing. Um, and then the other thing that they called out that was interesting, but again, not surprising, is that more than half of the patients with recent diagnoses have multiple independent sources for their online medical records, which again, I read as go to more than one provider group and therefore need to use more than one portal. But they don't actually explicitly specify that. So you can find the full report there. Again, as usually is the case, they have some, some graphs that go into more detail. Um, there's a lot more specific pieces of data available and ways to slice and dice things. Um, so go ahead and take a look if you're interested. Any questions, comments, or thoughts there? All right, let's move on to the last one. Um, I just thought I'd um, put this out there 
CMS has a free online course called From Data Elements to Quality Measures. And it's technically aimed at post-acute care measures. And there are some portions of the course that call out things that are specific to post-acute care. But a lot of the course is more generally applicable. Um, and it's particularly useful, I would think, to people who are newer to quality measures. For instance, um, it talks about different types of quality measures. Um, it talks about ways to look at data accuracy and how data is related to quality. And it talks about some of the basics of how measures are typically calculated, including talking about numerators and denominators and risk adjustment. So this is just three of the, these are three topics I pulled out that had sort of general high level, I'm a beginner type applicability. Um, if I remember correctly, there were about I want to say there are about a dozen topics in total. Topics being the 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 um, hyphen like bullet level, and uh, there's a little bit of information followed by a small activity under each topic. So there's the link to the course if you're interested, um, or if you work with someone who um, may be just starting to work with quality measures. Um, again, it won't, there may be pieces of it that are very specific. There are pieces of it that are specific to post-acute care. For instance, even under the relationship between data elements and quality measures, the first topic there is actually talking about the specific survey instr instruments that are most commonly used for post-acute care. So obviously that, that portion of it wouldn't be more widely applicable, but, um, if you're, good at filtering out some pieces that may not apply, I think it's actually really helpful. Any questions, comments, or thoughts on this? All right, if you'll go to the next slide and pause there for a moment. I hope you learned a lot from our quick updates. If you're interested in finding out more about the DGC and its other activities, email me at dgc at myhealthdata.org. That email address is also on your screen.